on, uh, I guess, the, the real beginning of winter here in, in Washington. Uh, I know it's a bit chilly. I'm Steve Clemens. I have a couple of roles. I'm the new Washington editor-at-large at The Atlantic, and uh, I hope you all read it and check in there. Uh, we're streaming live on theatlantic.com's website. Uh, I'm also senior fellow and founder of the American Strategy Program of the New America Foundation. And thirdly, I'm a huge fan and have been for many, many years of Ezra Vogel. Um, when Ezra told me that finally his, you know, this, what really has almost been a life work uh, has had, you know, was, was going to come out, I was so excited and eager, and I said, well, let me be part of the buzz a machine in part because when I got the galleys and looked at it very quickly knew that this would be the seminal and, and definitive work on Deng Xiaoping. We'll kick the tires of that to see, uh, in fact, if it's true. It's the one book that I know of that if you get the paperback version, it'll make absolutely no difference in its general <laughs> weight uh, and how you move it around. So uh, uh, Ezra Vogel, of course, is the Henry Ford uh, the second research professor of social sciences emeritus at Harvard University. In, in real ways, beyond the kind of uh, jargon of his bio, he is, uh, in my view, the dean of Asia Watchers uh, in America. We were just talking to Bruce Stokes a moment ago, and Bruce said, oh, yeah, we're here to talk about Japan, right? Um, because Ezra spans the field in Asia. Uh, he, is, he is, of course... Uh, the author of what I have uh, was told, I don't know if this is erroneous or not, so I should check my facts, but uh, I'm, st I'm still told that the largest uh, English language selling book in Japan is his book, Japan as Number One, uh, translated by some as Japan is Number One. Uh, it's interesting, if you once thought of yourself as a big power that mattered how hard to let go that is, and we might reflect on this in the United States sometimes. But in part, the reason we're here today to talk about uh, Deng Xiaoping and the transformation of China, this, this very uh, interesting book that I've had an opportunity to get about halfway through, so I have not gotten through all of it uh, just yet. We're talking not only about China and Deng uh, because of Ezra Vogel, we're talking about it because China, uh, this is not how do I not step on a landmine here? <laughs> uh, a book on Congo or Indonesia or Great Britain. China matters today. China is the new uh, nation of consequence. Uh, I sat in a meeting this morning at the New America Foundation on sort of future strategy, future grand strategy. We had a number of people from the national intelligence field, the director of national intelligence office, the Pentagon, and the data we were looking at, which was forward projected to look at 2030, 2040, 2050, showed one, one particularly uh, uh, was very dramatic, looking at the share of the United States, uh, middle class of the global middle class at that time. And it's a staggering picture when you look at what the composition, the percent composition of various countries will be in 2050 to what that is. We're not insignificant, but we are not, according to that graph, going to be the weight, the consequential weight. And my friend Kunio Kikuchi, who's here, Japan basically falls off the grid. Uh, so uh, uh, at, at least in percentage share. Uh, Ezra also served as the National Intelligence Officer for East Asia uh, in the U.S. government, and he has mentored and helped guide the careers and intellectual pathways for so many people uh, in this field. It's so remarkable. Uh, I remember even even far out of Asia, I remember meeting Carl Eikenberry, then a general who was our defense attache in China uh, years ago in the 1990s. And Carl, of course, went on uh, to prominent leading uh, forces in Afghanistan and was, was most recently our ambassador there. But I sent out a big blast of an email this morning. Many people watching online right now at the New America Foundation site or the Atlantic site or the Washington Note uh, got that email because I like to remind people, knock on their door and say, turn it on. Uh, got back to me from all over the world. I mean, really a flood of emails of people who were paying tribute uh, to Ezra Vogel and, and how important he was in their career. I was looking more for critiques and criticism uh, to help me this morning. Didn't get much, so we're going to have to invent it as we go along. But Ezra, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thank you so much, Steve. <laughs> So we're going to do this as a conversation this morning, and I've got the book, which you can go back to and refer if you, to if you like. Uh, Daphne has the books outside for those of you who'd like to get them. I hear that she's more than willing to help you carry them to your car. Uh, uh, why Deng Xiaoping? He was the guy that turned China around, and I think in the 20th century, there was no man who had a longer, lasting, large impact on the world. Uh, you know, you can look at Roosevelt and Churchill and others in the 20th century uh, who had a major role. But if you think about the broad outlines of history, turning China around from a country that was a mess 
uh, where 30, 40 million people just died uh, from the Great Leap Forward, where people were fighting each other, where Mao was trying to make revolution. And think of all the uh, communist countries that were trying to make the transition that didn't make the transition. And here is the biggest mess of them all. And a guy who led that transition to turn uh, brought over 300 million people out of poverty uh, and now set China on the path to become a dominant power of the world. That's a pretty big impact on history. And the surprising thing is that other people had not really taken up Deng seriously. There are several biographies of Mao, but no uh, heavy, big, serious uh, book on Deng. And uh, when I re retired uh, at the age of 70, uh, Don Oberdorfer said that what I should do was work on Deng. Uh, and uh, I decided that he was right, that, that he had fortunately seen Deng uh, and traveled with him when he came to the United States. And he had also studied East Asian history as a young man, so he had a broad perspective, and I, th I think his judgment was right. Now, Walter Isaacson, uh, who's president of the Aspen Institute now and, of course, a famous biographer, just finished his book on Steve Jobs. Um, I, I got to look at the only uh, version of it that's out there. It's secret. There are no galleys. I think it comes out November 21st. Uh, and Walter, in this private dinner, said that when he began the book, he only knew about 5% of what he ultimately came to know in his biography of Jobs. How was your journey with, with Deng Xiaoping? How much did you learn? How much did you um, already know? Is it, is it proper to measure it in that way? I had some outlines of what he was like, but there, uh, I didn't know very much. I would say maybe 10 to 15 percent. If you say the outlines of what he did, we knew quite a bit about that. Uh, I didn't realize the depth of his contact uh, around the world with so many world leaders and so many different countries and the depth of his understanding. And I didn't understand the strategy he used uh, to get there. Uh, he was a very skilled politician. He didn't go out uh, and... He used the word with me, manipulative. No, I don't no. think he was manipulative. I think oh. Mao was manipulative. I don't, think, I don't think he was... He had a sound strategy, uh, and he knew where he was going, and he, and he did the things that he needed to do, but he didn't play games the way Mao did. Uh, and he was pretty straightforward. He was a straight shooter. Uh, but uh, he, he didn't go out and uh, s say, I'm going to do X, Y, Z, when he knew it was controversial. He let it develop gradually. I think the way he decollectivized is one of the cleverest things. He didn't say, I'm going to decollectivize. A lot of the conservatives have been very upset. What he did is said, in places where peasants are starving, we have to let them find their own way to avoid starvation. Hmm. Sure enough, some of them found that by private farming, you'd get a lot better. Then he gets reporters to go study that. They bring that back to Beijing. And then a year or two later, he says, in those very poor areas, this is one of the ways in which we found that farmers can earn a living. Within one year, the whole place was decollectivized. So it, it's an interesting case. He knew where he was going, but he didn't get out on the limb to have a battle with the conservatives about carrying out that transition. So uh, I learned a lot about how he did it, and I learned a lot about how he dealt with foreign leaders. You know, when uh, after Reagan I had a visit with him, uh, he said, uh, he doesn't seem like a communist. Uh, he, he felt he, he was a guy he could deal with. You know, he, he was a straight shooter. He was a guy you could do business with. What were the things, I mean, when you write a biography about someone like this who was so enormously consequential or perceived to be so consequential as, as a, you know, trigger of, of so much change in China, there's a tendency to build statues to them, talk about their noble qualities. What were the qualities about Deng that were not so noble, that, that, that one shouldn't necessarily whitewash, uh, given the, the great things he did? Well, it depends, you know, is the, uh, how do you call what he did? You know, he, he called uh, the troops out uh, for June 4th uh, in 1989 at Tiananmen Square. Uh, the people who admired Deng felt the country would have fallen apart at that stage. The, the whole movement building up to that, before that, there were a lot of people uh, who were taking to the streets 
And on May 20th, as soon as Gorbachev left town, he called out troops unarmed not to shoot. They were stopped by people in the streets, and they couldn't regain order. <clears throat> I think the reason they were in the streets is he had made a bad mistake the previous year. He had tried to uh, take prices off set prices and free them to market prices. But the trouble was uh, the salaried people in Beijing, nearly everybody was on salary who was working, uh, they could see that uh, inflation was going up 30 40% a year. The new people coming in from the countryside, the new private entrepreneurs, uh, and China was at an early stage of modernization. Those people were just eking out an existence and worried that their savings was going to fall apart. Mm -hmm. And so they supported the students. And once they supported the students and the troops uh, could not keep order, he gave the order, you know, do what you have to do to keep order, and, and he did. So uh, the people who disliked it, a lot of people who watch television, uh, you know, hate Deng Xiaoping. Uh, I, as a biographer, I tell a story how he did it, what he did. In some detail. In some detail, yeah. and talk of the horrors of uh, several hundred people being killed. But Deng thought in big pictures, he didn't think of the individual. Has China decided to ban your book yet? Uh, they, there, a lot of publishers want to publish it, but they said they would have to make a few changes. Uh. And <laughs> so what I, what I've done, I decided to publish in Hong Kong. Thank goodness, Hong Kong uh. still has free publication. Uh. So the, it's being translated into Chinese, and will come out probably in May in Hong Kong in Chinese. And my friends tell me that uh, you can carry it from the airport uh, back into China. Uh, it's an interesting attitude that China now has about things like that. Uh, I can give speeches in China. I gave a speech on Deng uh, in Chinese. I speak Chinese at, at uh, East China Normal University a few months ago. Uh, <clears throat> and I said, I, I was straight. And they asked in me part about that's sort of you're trying to tell how great their leader is, that they want to also. But I also to told what he did uh, at Tiananmen. And a lot of the Chinese intellectuals now feel that Deng uh, could have done more to promote democracy. Mm -hmm. There were two uh, leaders, Zhao Ziyang and Hu Yaobang, who really wanted to push much faster. It was their judgment the country could still keep order and allow more room for freedom. Uh, Deng, who had seen the 50 years of chaos before Mao came to power and who had lived through the chaos of the Cultural Revolution, was more cautious and felt he had to clamp down more. So that's a hard judgment call. I don't think a foreigner knows enough to, to make the judgment call. What I try to do is explain how Hu Yabang felt, how Zhao Ziyang felt, what their role was, what Deng felt. And he was the, the power holder, so he imposed his will. And uh, the fact is that China has kept order for the 20 years since... Can you explain one thing to me, which I've, I've never really understood, and, and you do go into the book, but I want to ask it, not having, having read that. And this isn't a great, this isn't a perfect comparison, but it at least captures the notion of tension and different ideological tension. The fact that Mao was the top dog, still working within a system, and that, that, that Deng fell so many times and, and didn't go the way that so many other rivals of, of uh, Mao went, which means, you know, dead. Uh, is, it kind of reminds me of, of, of Dick Cheney keeping Chuck <laughs> Hagel around just because, you know, he, he might need the ideas that Chuck Hagel had about how to, you know, save the country at some point. Dick Cheney wasn't prone to those sort of things, and of course he didn't do that. Um, but I am interested in that sort of political tension that says some, something about Mao and Deng, but, but I mean, Mao to me is a fairly monstrous character, but I'm interested in what his political calculations were in, in not destroying Deng? Uh, in 1930, uh, Deng fell three times. Right. The first time he fell was in 1931. At that time, they, they were in a, a base. They had, Mao had built a rural base in Jiangxi province. Mm -hmm. uh, Deng, the previous, a few years earlier, had been in charge of leading urban insurrections in a neighboring province. He uh, it was an enormous responsibility for a 25-year-old. 
he worked with the warlords. He tried to get people uh, to build up a base area. He worked for over a year. He did a lot of great things, but he ultimately he absolutely failed. He arrived in Jiangxi, 1931, and Mao had done all those same things and succeeded. So he was one of those who could really understand what Mao had done and appreciated and respected him. That The first time Deng fell, uh, he was out for about six months. What was he accused of for supporting Mao Zedong? He was the leader of the Mao faction. So this is at a very tender early age where Deng gets in trouble because he supported Mao. So Mao always had kind of a soft spot for Deng that went way back to that period. He also realized how talented Deng was. Deng performed in his general secretary of the party. Another thing is that Deng was the kind who didn't ask questions. He, For 12 years, he was a soldier. And he was a soldier who saluted and carried out orders immediately. Uh, if asked to take his troops into battle in a very risky things, he didn't ask why or what. He did it. Hmm. And Ma, and all the campaigns in the 50s that Mao Wan had done, Deng was right there. Deng had written in, when he was in Moscow uh, and sort of describing his philosophy of things. He said, we need leadership and we need disciplined leadership. And the job of a person is to follow the orders. So he followed Mao. And then I think right after the uh, Great Leap Forward started, about a year after that, I, I interviewed Deng's daughter, and she said he could see pretty soon that it wasn't working. What did Deng do at that time? He knew that Mao was so powerful you couldn't oppose him, but you could distance yourself a little from Mao. And so you distance yourself from Mao and try to do what you can pragmatically to deal with the real issues. If Mao had at that point said do X, he would do X. Uh, so Mao, I, I, you got it exactly right. He put Deng, he wanted to give him a little punch in the hope that uh, he would follow out a little more closely and not try to go too much on his own. And he did that twice. And the last time was 1976, just before Mao died. Mm. Uh, so um, I, I think I think it was that 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 uh, connection that went way back. It was a respect for Dunn. I think another thing is that even the 60s, when internally he was trying to make some adaptations, he was great in fighting the Soviet Union. Uh, Mao sent him to carry on the arguments for the Soviet Union. 1963, the famous. Uh, kind of end of the fights when he was debating Sislov, he was right in there punching the Soviet Union. So he, uh, he, I think he liked that about Deng, that he, he could stand up to other countries when he had to and, and did it in a very skilled way. You know, when you read your book, you can't help, if, if you've been to China, knowing that China's fifth, fifth generation of leaders are, are, are going to rise this next year, um, comparing the ingredients in his life and the kind of decisions he took to them. And they look pretty bland, uh, technocratic, cardboardish. Uh, maybe we, we wait, need to wait for the bio, biography of Hu Jintao or something. But when you look at the next generation of leaders, and I know this is dangerous to some degree, but if he were running the show today a little bit, what would be some of the differences you see? Where would China be today that it's not? And I'll, let me just put on the table that I think China um, is struggling with, with a lot of major identity issues and, and how it manages what it does, that it doesn't understand the kind of uh, uh, self-interest of global self, selflessness. What does international stakeholding really mean in, in one part? And balancing that against a really deep mercantilism that I, that I see and, and a kind of hoarding of global goods and, and fear of the future. And, and it, 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 it kind of combines this sort of resurgent you know, ego with this uh, fear uh, uh, that things are going to fall apart. And I just don't see the kind of Deng Xiao. When you read the beginning of your book, you just don't see that kind of confidence. I, I think you're right about the difference between Deng and the, the recent leaders. Uh, analogy might be the grand guy who starts a company in the United States who thought of the whole big picture and took all the tough uh, fights. And then later on, somebody who grew up within the company and uh, came up step by step about being a good boy and getting along with everybody. 
but not having that experience as this broad person leading in a revolutionary fight for all kinds of different situations. I think if Dung were alive today, one, one thing he would be very firm about uh, would be that uh, China should not try to be aggressive. That he uh, decided that the Soviet Union was very wrong to spend so much on military and they were in danger of spending themselves out. It was important to have good relations with other countries so you didn't have to spend too much on the military. And you needed the, for all kinds of ideas. He, he wanted people to go everywhere around the world. He didn't worry about sending people to the outside. Uh, unlike the Soviet Union where a guy going outside uh, would have to work with someone, he wanted everybody to go around the world uh, and learn. Uh, after the Tiananmen incident, he said, we should not close the door because of that. We should open it wider. Uh, so I think he would be very firm in that. Secondly, he would keep down the military better. Because he had been a soldier in the military for 12 years, these guys, Hu Jintao, who are now leading China, had not had that kind of military experience. Deng had led, uh, in the end, the Huai Hai campaign with 500,000 troops. He had been the front uh, political commissar. Uh, he was, you know, almost like Eisenhower MacArthur uh, ending World War II. So he could, he would have clamped down on those military because he had that broad base of support. I think also he would move more boldly uh, to deal with uh, corruption now. When he was first getting started with reform, he felt that people, the cadre were so afraid to make a mistake, they'd been criticized so much during the Cultural Revolution. He felt that you had to be very free with it and not be too tough. If they, every little mistake they made, you clamped down on, you wouldn't get the bold dynamism. So it's true that he was soft on a lot of people, but he also felt that when corruption got bad, he had to be tough on it. After 1992, he said, you had to grab things with both fists. One fist, you push ahead and reform. The other corruption, it clamped down. And I think he would take bolder steps uh, toward corruption. After Tiananmen, Brent Scowcroft went over and basically knocked on the door, very controversial, secret trip. Um, what was the composite of that? What were the equities that they put on the table then? And I know you talked to Brent about the book a lot. What insights did you get from him about Deng at that, at that time? Well, well, first of all, I would say that Bush Sr. played a very key role in that because in 1975, when Mao put Deng in charge of things for a year, this is while Mao was still alive, that was the year that Bush Sr. was in Beijing as a head of liaison office. So he became very close to Deng. Hmm. So he was the one that wrote, a, I think, a very heartwarming letter after Tiananmen because he realized that uh, the two countries needed to continue to work together. If the two, it was so difficult to get normalization, the politics of both country and the world conditions, uh, and it was so such a tough situation uh, that uh, it wasn't clear uh, whether we could keep our two nations working together. And he sent Bro uh, Brent on that secret mission because he felt we had to keep the two countries together. He first tried to make a call. Brent, uh, Dung didn't want to accept the call. I don't think he wanted to get out on a limb either. Mm. Uh, but uh, when they offered, uh, 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 the United States uh, said, we'll send some mission, send some people, and Eagleburger went with Brent, uh, that uh, uh, Dung was happy to accept that. And what Dung said when he met them uh, was if Bush still wants to be my friend, I'll be his friend. But uh, he felt that uh, it wasn't for China to take a move at that time. The United States imposed very heavy sanctions, and he felt that the United States is the one that needed to take the step, that there was not much China could do at that point uh, in uh, building the relationship. They were ready to keep the relationship. They were ready to keep the place open. Uh, Deng also said... Uh, that uh, we'll have sanctions for a while, but uh, the Westerners will forget. Uh, they're businessmen in the, in the West who will want the access to our markets. They will talk to their governments, and within a few years, they will change. And so of course, he, he turned saw out that, to be right. He basically saying that's a lesson that despite 
basically killing a few thousand people in Tiananmen in a highly public incident, that we can still get away with it because we're important? Was that the... I don't think that's, that's the way he felt. He, he felt that it was a very tough situation, that China was very tough. They, he was worried about losing support of the youth, too. He wasn't mm -hmm. just worried about the support of the West. He was worried that, that they, the country might fall apart. Uh, the Tiananmen thing looked to him very dangerous. I mean, the, the, so many people in Beijing were supporting the students, and he could uh, feel that even the young people in the army, when the students, when the army trucks in Beijing got stopped, the students would start talking to them. And these poor army recruits didn't know anything about politics. They'd been from the countryside. They came in. The students knew so much more than they did. And some of them began to be infected by the students' attitudes from Dung's view. So uh, he was very worried the place could fall apart. And uh, he thought that the American support of the students straight, greatly strengthened the students and uh, could lead to you know, the place falling apart. And the, which, yeah. which key Americans did Dung value and which did he really dislike? Dung was the kind who was ready to get along with whoever. And uh, I the amazing thing is that everybody who dealt with Dung felt that they enjoyed Dung and that he he liked them. He, he uh, you know, during the 1970s... And names for those kind of people. <laughs> well, and, and when Nixon went uh, in 1972, Dung was down in the countryside doing labor. So he didn't meet Nixon at that point. But when he came, you know, he was a very pragmatic. He, he looked after China's interests, and he was prepared to work with anybody uh, whenever. Uh, he knew that, you know, the United States had been the enemy in the Korean War, their enemy during the Cold War. Uh, but uh, at, when he came to Washington in January 1979, he asked to see Nixon. He did the same thing in, in Japan. He asked to see Tanaka. Uh, Tanaka was under house arrest at the time because of the Lockheed <laughs> scandal. And Dung asked to see him. Uh, he said he was the one who built relations with Japan. We went to honor him. And so when he came to Washington, he asked to see Nixon. Nixon came to the White House dinner. Uh, you know, uh, as far as I know, that was the only time Nixon came to the White House after uh, the uh, Watergate uh, situation. So Dung asked to see him, and they had a private talk. Uh, Nixon then sent a letter uh, to uh, President Carter that was really a very thoughtful, pleasant letter after that, giving his thoughts about Dung. And then uh, a few months later, Dung, uh, Nixon visited Beijing. So he obviously you know, appreciated what Nixon had done and had good relations with Nixon. Carter, uh, I interviewed Carter about this, and Carter said it was one of the most pleasant uh, things in his presidency was working with Dung. When I talked to uh, Woodcock, uh, uh, and by this time Woodcock's widow, after Woodcock died, the widow Sharon Woodcock said that traveling with Dung and his wife was one of the most pleasant things because they were very easy to deal with. They knew who they were, and they relaxed, and they enjoyed themselves. I think Dung by that time had such a command of world events and had such power that he could let himself go and be a relaxed and fun kind of leader. Uh, he wasn't uptight. He he had uh, such confidence that he he could be kind of a fun fun loving person. Uh, with Bush Senior, he had extremely good relations, uh, and Bush uh, Senior said it was because of his relationship with Dung that he felt he ought to send Scowcroft and Eagleburger at that time. Uh, when uh, Reagan started out uh, in his campaign, saying he wanted to normalize relationship with Taiwan. Uh, Dung got terribly upset at, at uh, mm -hmm. Reagan. But then I think Bush Sr., as vice president, made a trip to Beijing, got that online, and made it clear that they weren't about to recognize Taiwan. That enabled Reagan to go, and then Reagan had a great time. <clears throat> when Dung went to Congress in 1979, uh, he met Tip O'Neill. Uh, Tip O'Neill was, was Speaker of the House, I think, at the time. Um, he talked with Tip O'Neill. Uh, Tip O'Neill uh, was telling about the fights between Congress and the White House. They had a wonderful time. And uh, Deng invited him to visit China. He did later visit China. 
But after uh, Tip O'Neill finished telling Dung uh, all these things uh, about the fights between the White House and, and the division of labor between legislature and the executive, Dung said, wouldn't work in China. <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't so, work in China. Wouldn't work in China. Yeah. But uh, I, I, I went on, I mean, you know I'm a professor and we are long-winded, but I went through that list of people to try to illustrate that there were a variety of people of very different political persuasions that he could get along with. Uh, I want to I say a shout out here to David Kenner at Foreign Policy Magazine who's watching live online. And he says everyone should watch this event on China's transformation. Uh, Steve Clemens almost got Deng Xiaoping to come, but he canceled. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was too good to pass up. Um, we know you have a lot of influence. So let me just ask two, two, two more quick questions, and then I want to open up the floor. One question I want to ask is, is you know, put them both on two, is what, what were the most surprising things you learned about Deng, the really surprising things about his family, about who he was, that, that, you just, that, that would just you know, be zingers that we should know? And I think, secondly, and, and, and perhaps a little more complexly, um, I recently read uh, Kissinger's new book on China. Now, there are some scathing critiques of this book out there that basically say it's a whitewash of China. Uh, uh, I sat next to someone the other night at dinner who asked me if I'd read the book and how much he loved it. And he says, the general. So I think there's a split. If you, if, you, if you may not be deeply immersed in China issues, you may have fewer problems. But Kissinger was laying out a political point, largely that he fears, to a certain degree, a collision course with China and wants to essentially lay out the context to some degree of why, you know, what China has been through and why it's such a vital and key relationship for the future. And I think he tries to do this through a kind of sweeping history. And I, and I respect that. But I guess my question to you is, what do we have to worry about? What are the downsides, the negative sides of Deng's China that Deng has embedded in China today that we shouldn't be so Pollyannish about, that we should think here is something that, that we Americans need to, need to take seriously, perhaps something that he embedded in the country that it's not been able to either modify or, or, or put well, in better context. One part of your question is what did I learn? And one yeah. of the things I learned uh, was that the ideas of, of reform and opening, which we associate with Dung, mm -hmm. didn't really start with Dung. You know? And I think a biographer has to be honest and balanced. Uh, they started under Hua Guofeng, and a lot of the ideas that Dung did were not really originally his ideas. So uh, I, I learned to have great respect for him. He was also very tough with other people. He, uh, Hu Yaobang and Zhao Ziyang served him very loyally. But when he thought it was necessary, he pushed them aside. I mean, he, he was the kind who made the calculation for what he thought was good for the overall. Uh, and if some Ruth, people, Ruthless opportunist? It wasn't so much opportunist because he was already there. He was mm -hmm. already powerful. Uh, I think he he believed in being ruthless if he had to. It's, he was a war commander for 12 years. Uh, you do what you need to do uh, to win the battle. Mm -hmm. And he thought he didn't have the same American views about individual respect for the individual, but for the collective. He tried to do what he thought would be good for the most people in the long run. So if some people suffered that was necessary for the broad picture. And I think that is a view that's shared by a lot of Chinese leaders. So I think that's one thing we have to con consider. I mean, they aren't going to have the same respects for individual right uh, that we have. Uh, whether it does good for the country as a whole, whether we can manage our problems, our big political splits in such a way to have uh, unity to carry on the big issues for what, doing for what's necessary for the long run, uh, I think is, is one issue that we have to wrestle with. Mm -hmm. But he, uh, in that situation, uh, was on the side of the, of the long run. So I th the, the, another thing I think we have to worry about now is that all of the Chinese leaders recognize, as Deng did, that you have to get along with the rest of the world. There are a lot of young Chinese in various places, in the military particularly, who think that we're now stronger. Uh, we don't have to put up with some of the things that we used to put up with, that uh, we've suffered humiliations uh, from the West for 150 years and been downgraded and uh, treated as you know, a second-run power. Uh, now we're strong. We have the economic leverage. 
uh, we can do a lot more. And I think that that's an attitude we're going to have to continue to deal with in China. His successors feel, I, I think Deng's view was they should always take the low posture. They should never behave like a hegemon. Mm -hmm. uh, and they should never interfere in the, uh, with other countries. Uh, he wasn't at the stage where he was willing to do things for the international system, for the sake of the international system. China wasn't that far along. His, his frame of reference, do for China what you can to get it out in the world and be accepted in the world. He didn't, his frame, of, he thought 30, 50 years ahead of time. Mm. But even within that frame, it didn't go so far as to say uh, the world order depends on our contribution to the world order. Uh, I think that's something his successors have to take up that he didn't take up. Interesting. Thank you. Let me open to the floor. Uh, we've got a question right here in the front. We have a microphone. Uh, Jordan is going to scramble forward. And if you'll identify yourself, please. Uh, Nadia Chao from Liberty Time, <coughs> Taiwan. Uh, Professor Vogel, we <coughs> understand that uh, during Deng Xiaoping's time, um, even though the relationship with Taiwan is hostile, there's still secret messenger envoy and letters exchange. I wonder, you know, how much have you learned at that time, the relationship between these two? And also at a time, Taiwan has uh, started the economic reform. Do you think this has any impact on Deng Xiaoping? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to do the last part first, I think that Taiwan, along with South Korea and Japan, did have a big impact. One very interesting thing I learned when I talked to Lee Guan Yu. Lee Guan Yu told me that uh, one time, Deng said, uh, you know, Jiang Jingguo and I were classmates in Moscow. Uh, in, uh, we went to the same school, Sun Yat-sen School, this is 1926-27. Uh, when next time when you go to Taiwan, would you ask my classmate, Jiang Jingguo, if we could meet? Uh, so Li Guan Yu went to Taiwan uh, to see if they could try to come to some kind of agreement. And Jiang Jingguo's answer was, you can't trust the communists. <laughs> so they never met. Uh, and I think Deng so much wanted to bring Taiwan in to be part of China. That was one of his greatest causes. And uh, <clears throat> in 1979, when he was trying to normalize the relationship with the United States, uh, he, he had very much hoped uh, that uh, we would not sell weapons to Taiwan and that if we didn't sell Taiwan, uh, his scenario was they would put pressure on Taiwan so that Taiwan would agree to become part of mainland if we didn't have uh, arms and that Taiwan would see that they were weaker and they had to come to that kind of agreement. I think his, his scenario was not fighting, but having the leverage and the power so that Taiwan, and he was never able to realize uh, his vision. Just to, along this line, just to piggyback on this Taiwan question and make it a little more provocative, outside of Deng, and I know this is unfair to you, I think the Chinese leadership today believe that they played such a vital role in stabilizing the global financial system during the financial crisis, and that Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, who had been on the other side of the line for a while on China, but, but Tim Geithner, all made it a sort of love fest that they thought that this was a moment of change and there would be a strategic leap in a different direction. And that explains to some degree China's fury at Obama about the Dalai Lama selling arms, that they thought that this was finally a pivotal moment. W was that a, like a Deng Xiaoping moment? Was this a miscalculation by China? And, and, and do you think there's ever a moment where you will get that sort of pivot where a strategic reassessment of the relationship ultimately involves not selling arms and whatnot to Taiwan. I think uh, that was uh, their hope, that they, they had now so much uh, financial power that uh, they now had the leverage that they could do things. And uh, as they see their military getting stronger, that uh, their they want to deny access to the United States so they could have the power to overwhelm. Um, I, you know, Deng, if I can use an analogy, and thought about the Soviet Union was, in 1979, after the, uh, China attacked Vietnam, he thought that their relations with the Soviet Union would be stable, but he didn't think they could ad advance until the Soviet Union felt that they had uh, no longer uh, the wherewithal 
uh, so by the time they ended the decade of the 1980s, he felt that they, you know, they could get uh, uh, Soviet Union to pull back troops along Inner Mongolia. They could get uh, Cambodia to pull back uh, uh, Vietnam to pull back from Cambodia. So, uh, and sure enough, by 1989, the Soviets were that weak. And that was a pivotal moment. And then Gorbachev came to China on Deng's terms, really, that Deng had thought about it a decade earlier that could not then be realized. Mm. So I think there, my hunch would be that there are still people in China who think, okay, maybe this is too early. Mm. But there may be some time when the financial and military leverage will be stronger that we will be able to take that one. I think that's a very real possibility. That's interesting. Ira, did you have your hand up? Ira Shapiro? I didn't, but I have Oh, okay, good. <laughs> and then we'll come up here to the front. Ezra, you, you wrote Japan as number one, and then after we were all discouraged, you wrote Come Back to explain how the United States would come back. I'd be interested in your perspective on the current situation uh, of the United States as it considers its strategy or absence of strategies toward China. And sort of a specific question of what should America's corporate executives be thinking about with respect to China? How should they be balancing the company's interests against the interest in job creation in the United States? Uh, first of all, I'm delighted that my, to see my friend Ira uh, again, that we worked together at an earlier time. Um, I'm not up on the details of what's going on in Washington, and I'm afraid that uh, an outside professor from the regions up in Massachusetts uh, can only access, uh, make vague comments that probably aren't very helpful, but I'll make them anyhow. Uh, this reminds me of how dumb I talk. <laughs> I think we have to find some way to look at the common interests of you know, both parties and uh, all parts of both parties uh, to think about our long run and that we need people who have the courage uh, to put those statements and to try to find some way to deal with our long-term financial thing. Uh, my hunch about the job creation uh, as Jim Fallows uh, has said, you know, if if they can make something for two dollars that we sell for twenty nine dollars here, uh, if we you know push them on the end, it might go up to three dollars, but that's not going to bring jobs back to my home state of Ohio. Uh, it just it, that's not going to do it. And uh, I think we do need new ways of creativity. I think uh, that our economists and financial specialists uh, have uh, put tired too much uh, income on the very top 1% and that we need some responsible people uh, to spread that out and to think more about what it takes to create jobs and new companies uh, and not just how to make you know the latest uh, few million dollars on the killing. So that's my uh, sermon as an outside outsider who doesn't have to deal with the tough realities well, that you this gentleman, here have to deal with. This gentleman right here, but I'll just you know give you one data point. Out of 75 countries, Microsoft derives uh, less from, uh, I, I guess China comes in number 75 out of 75 countries for the amount that Microsoft derives from every computer. It's a remarkable uh, data point. And, and I mean, if it were number 30 or number 20, but to basically come in dead last, it's an interesting indication of whether or not the strategy, and I won't put Ira's name on this, but there were a number of people who were arguing at a, at, at a time that you had to get China in the WTO, you had to get it in the rules-based order, you had to basically negotiate, and you were going to sort of seduce China forward, it would get enough vested interest, it would get enough people getting rich, that they would then become transformative inside their own society and get others, they would get an appetite for intellectual property right protection, et cetera, et cetera. That may be going on, but it's not going on, I think, if you talk to Jeff Immelt and a lot of others at, at the level at which was expected 
in say the mid 80s and early 90s when that when when those decisions when we were struggling with those decisions. One thing I would say comparing uh, Japan and China, I think Japan was much further along technologically when it took off, and it, it protected its own uh, companies, its own industrial technology, and I think Japan made the transition to having its own patents much earlier, and therefore was much more concerned about the international uh, patent protection regime than China. Uh, a lot of the best technology in China is still held by foreign companies, and as you know, mm. so, many, so much of the high-level exports uh, from China are really through foreign companies. That wasn't the case in Japan. So I think that's one quite striking difference. Interesting. Right here, sir. Yes. Thank you very much. Raghubir Goyal, India Global Initiative today. My question is, um, do you believe uh, three points? One, the United States had given China everything in a golden platter without any conditions, even though China, Chinese leadership were ruling ruthlessly, no human rights, no rule of law. I'm going to make you make these quick questions yeah. if you've got three. So. so Then and even now. Finally, what advice do you think you have today for President Obama as far as the problems in the United States economically? And finally, if China is misusing the United States Security Council membership, I mean the uh, veto power. Great, thank, thank you. you. So Security Council, advice for Obama, and did we give it all away? Um, I don't think I really have any new advice for Obama. He has a lot of economic specialists who know much more about these issues. And I think he's, as a whole, uh, gotten pretty good advice on China. I think he has a small staff, but a good staff working on China. I think, if anything, at the very beginning, he wanted to make it clear to China that we were being different, that the last two administrations, uh, the Clinton and the Bush Jr. administrations, had been started uh, on a very anti-Chinese note, and he wanted to uh, come on a, a calmer, more friendly note at the beginning, and I think some people in China took that as a sign of weakness, and perhaps we didn't make that as clear, and we had to make that clear later on. But I think, as a whole, they've done uh, quite well. Did we handle them, hand them things on a golden platter? I don't think so. I think uh, we had our interest, uh, too, in cooperating with uh, China and dealing with the Soviet Union first as strategic interests. Uh, and uh, I think they're, uh, we, after all, buy their goods, and our consumers benefit from the low price. So I, I don't think it's entirely we lose jobs, but we, we get more goods that are cheaper that our people can afford. So I don't think it's all that uh, one-sided. Uh, Bruce Stokes? I know there are a lot of hands. I'm just going to bounce around to even it out. Uh, Bruce Stokes of the German Marshall Fund and National Journal. Ezra, um, to follow up on Steve's point, um, I think a lot of people in the West assume that over time, in part because of Deng's reforms, that the Chinese economy would become more like ours. It would look more like Western-style capitalism. Uh, as you, having studied this and, and knowing China as you do, as you project ahead 10, 20 years, uh, do you anticipate that Deng-style Chinese capitalism will look like Western capitalism, or will it be its own unique kind of capitalism with Chinese characters? And if so, then is it what role the state enterprises in that role? What right. what are the other differences you would forecast maybe for a Chinese state capital or right. Chinese capital? I think Deng, uh, you know, some of the early uh, accounts of Deng when he came to the United States where he really wants to be a capitalist. He, he just can't call it that. But I, I don't think that's an accurate description. He wanted uh, to. He didn't want businessmen to have that much influence on political decision. He wanted to have a political group at the top that was insulated from business and that could make decisions on what they thought was good for the party and the country as a whole. He also kept uh, didn't uh, uh, non-private ownership in the countryside. The land is not owned by uh, individuals, mm -hmm. and that gives the collective at the local and the national level much more leverage at the end. Uh, and uh, he also uh, felt that state planning and state corporations should also have a major role and that they, the, there should be a political group at the top to make those uh, decisions. Uh, in 
terms of what I project, I think they will try to maintain that. But I think, from what I understand, these state companies are becoming more and more independent. As they get global, uh, their interests are increasingly different from those of the top political leadership. So I would expect these state corporations, as they invest in oil around the world and uh, Latin America and the Middle East and other places, I would expect them to behave more like multinational corporations anywhere uh, that have global role and take uh, less direction from the top uh, parties. In terms of agriculture, when Deng was in his very end, he said, uh, you know, individual agriculture in China is such tiny plots that there may need to be larger kind of groups uh, of uh, agriculture and we shouldn't rush into that. We should wait until we have the support of the people to do that. But I think those tiny plots are really not made and already you're being seeing some transition in the Chinese countryside to large, just as, you know, to meet international market demands, uh, larger collective units in agriculture. So you're beginning to see some of that in, in China. Now, the only thing I would, you know, add just to throw in a little prov provocative notion here that, that I think goes uh, a different direction than you just laid out is that uh, if you look at the most significant emerging features of the global economic system and you look at where nations are putting their bets, they seem to be putting the, on their bets on, on strong state capitalism-like structures. That's what's moving. We're going to Abu Dhabi, uh, a bunch of us, for the World Economic Forum meeting there on the, uh, looking at geopolitical risk. And it's really one of the emerging things for the United States to consider is essentially these, this new architecture that fundamentally the largest firms in the world are essentially run by governments. So, and the, the oil and energy firms, the, uh, 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 a lot of the financial firms, what's going on with financial bourses around the world and what's going on with sovereign wealth funds, that in that front, and, and China's right, right in the mi middle of all of this, is that if you were to look at, at a game of Go, you know, with black chips and white chips, those who were arguing about how we generally ran uh, operations, whether multinational firms, ran, and you looked at an alternative, and let's just call it the, the Deng Xiaoping version. The Deng Xiaoping version seems to be, have a lot more chips on the table. I just put down the table, but let's go here, then Paul, and then right here to Kami, and, and then Eric. Uh, looking at the long history of the world, it's a world of changing alliances all the time. Do you see China starting to form uh, alliances with other countries in the traditional sense that we've had changing alliances uh, historically? My own hunch, and, and I, I'm not as specialist in this as much as some others, is that uh, those big national alliances may be a thing of the past. The world is now so globalized that you don't get a national actor uh, having alliances in the same way that we did uh, in the Cold War period. And that there are so many linkages growing between groups in China and the West, and so many uh, linkages uh, at all levels, between NGOs around the world, that I think the the old uh, earlier period of national alliances uh, will not be so strong. Uh, China will have interests all over the world. Uh, it already is moving quickly into the Middle East and Africa and other places. We do too, uh, and I don't I don't see those as necessarily opposed to each other. Uh, we will be working in joint multinational uh, companies uh, with Chinese companies in a lot of those places. So my own hunch is that the, the national alliances will not be uh, as serious a problem in the future. Uh, Paul Helmke, our former mayor of Fort Wayne, Indiana. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. It, uh, your, your comments about uh, Nixon, Bush Sr., um, talk, make us realize that there was a long Republican tradition of either opposing China what, what or engaging party are with you China. In, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> I was selected as Republican, yeah. but uh, the Republican debates, uh, little discussion of China. Huntsman obviously uh, ties to China. How do you read? Uh, you know, it, it's been more of a negative for Huntsman. Is Huntsman the, the second coming of a Nixon or a Bush Senior? And how about the rest of the Republicans that are out there? Do they even know anything about China? Um, that's not my specialty, and you know that better than I do. I have met Huntsman, and I'm very impressed with his knowledge of China. 
I think in terms of foreign policy, uh, he's an extraordinarily well-prepared uh, person. I, I can say that, and he's very thoughtful in the way he communicates to the American public about China, uh, looking after our interests at the same time, uh, recognizing all the difficulties uh, that China faces and trying to explain to the American public why Chinese feel and act as they do. I, I think he's just superb on that. Uh, I don't really know enough about the views of other Republican candidates, but my guess is they're not very well informed on China, and they would have to rely on a lot of other people uh, to inform them about China. I'm going to cluster a few questions now, and I'll keep track. Uh, yes, sir. My name is Kami, but I write for the Pakistani Spectator, and my question is about Chinese leadership once it's come to their friendship or relationship with a neighboring country like Pakistan, India. Are they very linear thinker like American who make very transactional contract with Pakistan, okay, you do for us and we do for you, our Chinese use little bit emotionality. Uh, and I'm asking you this question because Pakistani generals have become very, very reckless. They clashed with Soviet Union, they clashed with India, and now they are clashing with America. So how much dependence of, of, of Pakistani generals on China is justifiable? You know, how much China would come to when Pakistani economy collapses. Interesting question. So Pakistan and China, let's go to uh, Kunio Kikuchi for a moment and then back to Eric, and then we'll jump to these gentlemen. We're getting uh, to you. I'm with uh, Washington Research and Analysis. Uh, comparing Russia and China, I think the big difference might be their existing global network. Uh, specifically, I'm talking about the uh, diaspora or as it or the Hakka Chinese communities around the world. I think Mr. Deng Xiaoping is also a Hakka Chinese person, and I have great respect for them. Can you elaborate a little more on that, if possible? So overseas Chinese, and let's uh, go to Eric Wu. Eric Lowe, excuse me. Hi. Um, one thing I was very interested to know, because I used to live in Hong Kong for a long, long time, is that uh, the, the thing about Deng Xiaoping is the proposal within Hong Kong for the one country, two system thing, which actually worked for Hong Kong for still today. People think, oh, once it goes back to China, it's finished, but actually it's still prospering. So much so, the government is giving 700 U.S. dollars back to everybody who has a, who has a, a bank account in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. So basically, the prosperity has been guaranteed, but how did he come up with this uh, 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 idea? This is the my, mo most imp interesting Thank thing. Thank you. Let's take these two guys right here in the back, just a couple of them there. Hi, I'm Paul Steven. I go to George Washington University. Uh, I was wondering, one of the main sources of contention that I've heard uh, about Deng Xiaoping is the, the Sino-Vietnamese War. I was wondering what, if, if any, new revelations you have about this or his intentions or motives in the war, because I know it is very controversial. Um, so, yeah. Good to raise controversy in this gentleman right here. Don't worry, Ezra, I've got it all down. <laughs> <laughs> ben Amtalablu, also GW at the Elliott School. Uh, my question is more about these kind of sweeping books, like uh, Steve Clement spoke about Henry Kissinger's on China. Like the goal kind of seems to be mitigate the rise, mitigate the rise, and you spoke about how Deng advocated for the lower posture, um, not being the hegemon, not being that ma major global footprint. How would, we, how would he react to kind of these kind of boxed-in strategies of mitigating China's rise? Great, thank you. All right. Uh, I'm a professor, and it's hard to talk so briefly about okay. all these complicated issues. <laughs> giving an opportunity to, to offer hybrid answers. I'll try to be quick. In Pakistan, uh, China has long considered Pakistan a special friend, and that they, they, they encouraged the United States to form a closer relationship with Pakistan. So I think in terms of keeping the friendship and trying to do things with Pakistan, it matters a lot to China. However, if Pakistan should be engaged in war with others, I wouldn't count on Chinese aid. I think they, they're very risk averse to getting into battles, and I think that that's very unlikely. On the question of uh, the, uh, Deng, uh, the, the global network, the diaspora, um, you know, in, when, when uh, we pushed the Deng in Washington on the Jackson Vanek bill, in the Soviet Union, would they let their Jews go? Uh, would you let your uh, uh, people uh, come out? He said, how many would you like? Five million? Ten million? Uh, that was the end of the conversation. Uh, he, he would, we have, you know, 
tens of millions of Chinese have gone overseas. The best we know, we, we don't know that Deng was Hakka. Uh, he has not acknowledged that he was Hakka. There is some indication that his family came from originally from Jiangxi uh, and came into Sichuan in the Hakka line, but it is not proven, and his family does not acknowledge that. But uh, I think that he believed in sending as many people abroad as can. And one thing that was so different than many, than even the Taiwanese view, Taiwan leaders were afraid of the brain drain of losing so many people. Deng was not afraid of that. He felt people overseas can still be helpful. Uh, the Nobel Prize winners like Yang Zhenning and uh, Li Jindao, uh, Sam Ting, they could all give lectures, they could train students here, they could give advice, they could still be helpful to China, and he didn't mind their staying abroad. So he, he was ready to work with the diaspora wherever they were, and he felt that these people cared about China, and he could still work with them. In the Hong Kong, I think the interesting thing to me about the one country, two systems was it, to go back to about 1982 when Thatcher first went uh, to uh, Beijing. Because at that time, just a few years after the Cultural Revolution, there was a real question as to whether communists who had just you know, brought the Cultural Revolution and divided up the country would have the wisdom to, divide, to lead a modern multinational city with the sophistication that Hong Kong then had. And many people doubted whether they would. One of the things that Deng did was bring Xu Jiatun, a leading political leader of Hong Kong. He felt that the people in Hong Kong doing the communist bidding were too low level and had too limited views. He wanted Xu Jiatun to form contacts with the Hong Kong elite and, in a sense, to train apprentices for the 17 years before they took power and that by that time they would be ready to take power and be well trained for that. So I think that that it was the uh, one country, two systems. Uh, we usually tend to think of the arguments between Thatcher and so forth. But to me, the, the essence was in training the people who believed and were ready to work under the communists uh, to work for and understand the system so that after 1997, when it reverted to mainland uh, leadership, they were ready uh, and they had the patience to give enough distance to Hong Kong that they could still rule their own place. Um, well, I got one more question. Sino-Vietnamese War and <clears throat> Sweeping Books. Uh, okay, <laughs> Sino-Vietnamese Sino War. Um, in 1978, when Vietnam invaded Cambodia, Dung was terribly worried that after U.S. withdrew from Vietnam, that uh, the Soviets were now on the march. America was not standing up to them. And he told President Ford, uh, when Ford visited in December 1975, uh, he said, you know, we've had a long experience with the Soviet Union. If you pardon the expression, I think we understand them better than you do. And you can't discuss just things with the Soviet Union. Uh, he thought that I, talking of detente was just talking. The Soviets didn't understand that language. You had to, had to give them a bop and show your determination in order to get them to shape up. So he gave them a bop. Uh, and he, he was afraid that the, the Vietnam was going to let Da Nang uh, and other places go to the, the Soviet leadership. They were going to build a navy. They would go out. Uh, Cameron Bay would be used as a Soviet base. And China would be unable to control Soviets all in the area. And he felt that a bop would uh, get it under control. Uh, American military said that the, the, the Chinese troops didn't do well. They were beaten uh, time and time again by the Vietnamese. But Deng felt that he won the political war. Uh, he made the point, and Soviet did not advance after that. And uh, Vietnam got bogged down, and a decade later was out of Cambodia. So he, he felt that he won... Uh, the political battle. Just as a quick side point on that, Henry Kissinger <clears throat> recently told me that he thought the Soviet Army deserved the Nobel Peace Prize because rapprochement between China and the United States happened because of all those <laughs> tanks massing on the border, uh, Soviet tanks. So made made life easier, clarified the mind. But And then the final... Sweeping books. Uh, sweeping 
the Kissinger book on China, other books that, I, if I'm taking your question right, is really about mitigating and softening and dulling our senses, if you will, to the rise of China. I, I, I think Kissinger in his, his book is, is doing, trying to do a good thing. And late in life, with all his experience, he thinks uh, that one of the most, uh, the biggest challenge in the world we're facing now is not fighting with the Chinese. He tries to explain them, and he talks particularly about this uh, coal report in, in Britain uh, that said that, I mean, to me, that's the essence of the story. That uh, that he was worried, and, and, and the British were worried in 1907 that there was nothing you could do to stop the, the Kissinger thinks there are things you can do, and uh, I, th- I Kissinger is not a China specialist. There's a lot he doesn't know, and he doesn't claim to know. Um, I think that uh, uh, he he didn't get out in Chinese society and see, you know, he he dealt with things at the top, but I I I think in in, in in essence, uh, I think that's a message. tweetable line. Kissinger is not a China specialist. <laughs> just uh, in case somebody's listening. <laughs> in let, case me, let me just uh, bring this to a close because I want to give an opportunity. Claim to be one. Yeah, yeah. I want to give uh, uh, Ezra an opportunity to meet many of you. I know many old friends are here. Uh, we have some books out there that Daphne has if you'd like to get Ezra to sign, sign uh, them. But James Fallows, my colleague, we're going to be with tonight. Has, has the franchise in the Atlantic on writing the uh, definitive work on presidential debate. So every four years, he writes the zinger debate on who the Republican is going to be and who the Democrat, and he goes in, does massive research on what they did. And he, was, he did this on Al Gore. And, and his final line... Teddy White? He what's that? He thinks he's Teddy White. I guess so. <laughs> and, 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 but but uh, on Al Gore... The final line I'll never forget of the Atlantic piece was, is he had always respected Gore, and he started out, he had known Gore sort of largely come out of that, of that um, ilk, uh, uh, Fallows did. And then he says, I now know a lot more about him, but I like him less. It was the final line of the piece. And I'm interested in how you feel about your experience with Deng Xiaoping. You now know a lot more about him. Do you like him more? Do you like him less? I respect him more. <laughs> and uh, I think... Uh, I, I wouldn't have been a friend because he didn't think and t- a friendship wasn't the basic thing. He was thinking in broad issues. I could work with him if I were uh, had my representing a foreign country. Uh, I, I wouldn't think of him as a friend because in the crunch, uh, he doesn't do things on the basis of friendships. He does things in what he thought was national interest. So that's my view of them. You know, I'll just say in closing, you know, this uh, last summer I was in Beijing and a friend of mine knew where Deng Xiaoping's old compound was, which you can actually walk up next to, but there's no signs on it. There are a couple of guards around it. It's shuttered. And, but, I mean, there are people clearly living in there, uh, and it's nicely taken care of, but there's, you know, it's just sort of a block on the block. And I tried to take my picture in front of it. It got really shushed away with some, some vigor. Uh, but I'm going to take the book with me next time and like hold it up there to see if I can get my picture <laughs> taken in front of the house and see if I can, if I get tossed in jail. Um, but, but in any case, uh, I also think this is interesting because when i I was doing a piece, uh, once looking at the biographies presidents read. You know, they read about Churchill, they read about Alexander the Great, they read about, you know, Disraeli and various leaders, uh, uh Patton. Uh, and this was true. In fact, I got a lot of hate mail once by, Uh, having a very good list about all the books that George W. Bush had read. He was sort of faking he didn't read, but he read all the time. Uh, And many of them are biographies. And there's never really been something like this for Deng Xiaoping. So I'm sure that future presidents of the United States are going to be this because they're addicted to reading about other big, powerful uh, leaders. And uh, uh, this will no doubt be there. But Ezra, congratulations on the book. Uh, Thanks for letting us kick the tires with you a bit here and uh, joining us today. And let me uh, let's all give Ezra a round of applause. Thank you. 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 Uh, I want you all to spend some time with Ezra, but you've got to do it first at the book table. <laughs> <laughs> this, this movie right up. Okay. Can you take this out? Yeah.